It's what's alive and well today. It matters so much because if these are just aspirational values, they don't mean anything. You can write them on the, on the family doctrine and put those pieces together, but if you're not living those values and finding additional ways to live them, they're worthless, you know? You, they're not worth the paper they were written on. So that's a really good point. And it's okay to go back as we're changing generations to say, you know, are our values the same today? What are we all going to agree on together? Because that matters. And that goes back into L. I wanna, Steve was talking about co-create the pivot. I think there's a whole lot of things that can be co-done at this point, the pivot being one of them. We're just kind of talking about this, but you know, whether it's the pivot or something else, what are some other ways of co-creating within the family and between generations? One of the things that uh, we point out to people, and I just want to make it clear for the fabulous people here, is that it, within families systems that are successful, we don't have to agree on everything, but we can be aligned on everything. So the, the differential between agreement and alignment um, gives a lot of peace and ease to people like we can decide that we don't want to talk to each other anymore for 15 years but as we all have to be in alignment on that and sure there's some work that could be done before we come to that conclusion but it's not like we sit around at the end of the day and all kumbaya hug each other and love each other great if that happens but um what when we look at the co-creation component what we're seeing emerge is in the value realm, words mean different things to different people. So if the word is written, um, freedom is a value. I could ask every single one of you and you would give me 10 different words of what that means to you and where the co-creation with the intergenerationally or even among spouses, like what you agreed to as your social contract 15 years ago before your business took this up or this down can be renegotiated. We just don't have to agree to something that was written once and is not there. But um, the point for the co-creation among the generations is, hey, when I say that I have the value of, um, let's see, volunteerism, that doesn't mean that I reject your dad, mom and dad's philanthropic endeavors to be X. I might be passionate about whales. You might think that's ridiculous, but we, if we can have a conversation, we can actually back into the value is there, the way it shows up or the way we allow it to express itself is different. And it's that independent autonomy where with resilience, if you want to create thriving inheritors, we need the creativity and the freedom to like sh show what that means for us and not feel complete pressure or overwhelmed by what you created as what I, the, the barrier that I need to carry on my back for the next lifetime. Yeah, love it. I get, I'm reading a book right now I'll share with everybody called The Trillion Dollar Coach. Anybody, if, you've, if you haven't read The Trillion Dollar Coach, I think that even though this was not done inside of a family business, the, the, the thought process that he had for coaching. And the reason why it's called Trillion Dollar Coach is he ended up coaching Eric Schmidt from Google, um, uh, some people from Facebook. And, and if you looked at the market cap of all the businesses that he had been coaching, it's well over a trillion dollars. It's much bigger than, than that. And this Bill Campbell was a really soft-spoken, laid back, humble human being that just had a really unique way. And here's what's really neat, Ella, you'll love this. He used to work at Kodak for a while. So he, was, he spent time in Rochester. So it's, uh, it was really neat as I'm reading this and listening. Yeah, I, I listen to books on audio. Um, as I'm going through it, I'm like, this is brilliant. And there was just a lot of things that could be brought into the family because it was all about how do I make the team better? I'm not looking to make Eric Schmidt better. I'm looking for Eric Schmidt you know, when he's running Google to make Sergey and you know the rest of the team better. And that's no different inside of the family. And I, you know, when I wrote my book, one of the things that I said about families was the parents need to make the transition. And it's our responsibility as parents to transition. You have to parent through a certain age. That's just, you have to. But there comes a time when you move from parent to coach, mentor, and you need to allow them to make mistakes and do some pieces, you know, do some things differently that you might not do and learn from, you know, like we said, you learn more from your mistakes, right? 
So, you know, and, and the crisis. And then, then you transition to colleague. And let me tell you, that one's really tough for me because I'm always going to be dead. And it's really hard sometimes to take that hat off and just have those good, exciting conversations together. But if we can, as you know, the, the leading generations, be able to make those things happen, that's difficult for my dad. You know, it's really difficult to take that hat off. That's, I think, one of the reasons why I retired, because I was driving him crazy with my ideas of what I want to do with families and whatnot. And he just wanted to stick to the traditional, let's just do that advanced estate planning and business planning and buy sell agreements. I'm like, no, I want to dive in and get messy and have fun with this. So Steve, I'll yeah. go ahead, Ella. I want to I want to take what Ella said earlier about alignment not necessarily being the same as agreement. And, and, and it's more of a consensus building and consensus decision making. And, and what you're saying, Michael, about how one generation was probably very likely more authoritarian and one person makes the decision and then tells everyone else to implement it. We're getting away from that really, really quickly. And, that, and so being able to do things on a consensus basis and and more democratic decision making is becoming much more important. And where I take alignment, and I haven't written this blog yet, but I probably will in the next few weeks, is about alignment and engagement. And being, and I, I see them as kind of two sides of the same coin, meaning like if you have, you can't have one without the other. So if you can't really have alignment if the people aren't engaged enough to be aligned, but it's hard to get the engagement if the people aren't already somewhat aligned. So it's it's kind of like you, you as you as you improve the alignment, you should be improving the engagement, and as you improve the engagement, you should be improving the alignment. And for families that want to transition wealth from one generation to the next, the more things they can do together in those in that space of alignment and engagement the more successful they're going to be. If it's that family meeting that dad calls and makes everyone come to basically download what's in his brain and tell everyone what to do, which my father had a meeting like that, a family meeting in 1985, and didn't call another family meeting until 2006, which he called because he got diagnosed with cancer. So like, don't wait that many years and don't have a family meeting where the ad agenda is just downloading everything top down. Start to build the engagement, start to build the alignment, start to figure out how both generations of the family can be involved in making the decisions so that when one generation exits, the other one will have been involved in building everything that is there to continue to grow for the next generation. And what about the concept of like having a little fun while this is happening? Like, God forbid you like each other, right? Like, could you even find a world where you gather not just when it's for business matters. Um, we've worked with a family that I love that they hold a family meeting every week and starting at like the age of two, the children all rotate like who takes notes for the family meeting. And when they're two, they just color and they sit along and they talk. But by the time they're eight or nine or 10, you know, they're taking different notes. And you, like, where are the roles and where can we like let people be who they are, but still have them included. And just because you don't have decision-making power doesn't mean you don't have influence and that's like a whole nother topic but around um like the component of don't wait till you have a vote if you still have a veto like where are we playing with um getting really clear within family systems that do i have a vote do i have a veto do i have influence what do I actually want? What do I not care about? Like, maybe I'm tired of fighting this one battle, but I've been known for 20 years as the one who is like, we're not cutting down that tree that takes up that space to be like, I'm going to let that go. How can I show up in a new way when I've created the story in my head that that's who I am as a person and therefore I'm, un I'm disagreeable or unagreeable within the family system?